Hello everyone and welcome back once again to the channel and to another tutorial video on the Phoenix HV20, more specifically the EFB or electronic flight bag. The Phoenix, as of the time of recording this video, is one of, if not the most comprehensive add-on that you can get for Microsoft Flight Sim, and thus there are a lot of settings that you can change in the EFB to suit your own flying style. In today's video I'll be trying my best to explain what every setting does and how it affects your flights. Quick disclaimer before we dive into it, I'm not a real world pilot, let alone Airbus pilot, so be aware that some things in this video might be slightly inaccurate. For a more detailed explanation, I can recommend quite a few real world Airbus pilots who make good quality content on YouTube. Links to their channels can be found throughout the video. Now without any further ado, let's get into it. Starting off with the airframe settings, these settings all affect what equipment is installed on the aircraft, as in real life this can vary from airline to airline. The first thing you can add is a DDRMI, or Digital Distance Radio Magnetic Indicator. RMIs can often be found on older airlines like the 727 for example, but nowadays they are quite outdated and have little use in modern glass cockpits as far as I know, but the option to add one is there for some extra redundancy. The only thing that distinguishes a DDRMI from an older RMI, from what I understand, is that the newer one can also display the DME distance to a certain navate digitally. Next to that, you can toggle what kind of standby instruments you want. You have the choice between either analog gauges or an all-in-one digital display. The next gauge you could add is an extra metric altimeter which does the same as a normal altimeter, except the unit of measurement is now in meters instead of in feet. In some countries like China and Russia, for example, ATC still uses meters when giving climb or descent instructions, so it is important to be able to know what your current altitude is without having to convert from feet to meters the entire time. However, this extra instrument isn't crucial for this, as the Airbus A320 has a knob which allows pilots to display their altitude in meters next to their normal altitude indicator on the PFD. Again, this extra gauge is purely for redundancy. Moving on, we have the cabin ready toggle. What this does is simply add an extra item to the ECAM checklist when you press the takeoff config knob to check that the cabin is actually ready. Next up, we have brake fans. Some airbuses have fans to cool down the brakes after landing or a rejected takeoff, and some airlines might choose not to install these. I presume because in colder climates the brakes could be sufficiently cooled by the ambient air and does not really require extra cooling from these fans. Next to that is the toggle for the DCDU, which stands for Data Link Control and Display Unit. These are the two displays that are part of the more extensive ACAR system and allow pilots to receive messages from ATC like their IFR clearances for example. And this is especially handy during busy times at airports, where a lot of pilots have to make voice calls at the same time. Finally, we have the satellite an antennas, which can be installed on the aircraft. There are three separate options, including no antenna, a European one, and an American one. That concludes the airframe settings. Next up are the airline modifiable information settings. To start off, we have the FLS toggle, which stands for FMS Landing System. From what I could gather on the internet, what this system does is create a virtual localizer and glide slope that the aircraft can follow as if it were a normal ILS signal. It is used for non-precision approaches like RNAV or VOR approaches, and it is basically a step up from the normal VNAV and LNAV guidance. I'm not going to go into how to use this system as that would be outside the scope of this video. However, if you want to learn more about it, I can recommend a video from 320 Sim Pilot's channel. Continuing on, we have an option to turn on TCAP. This is a sort of extension of the TCAS system, which is used to avoid mid-air collisions. When this system is installed, in the case that two aircraft get too close to each other, the flight director will give vertical guidance to avoid a collision. And when the autopilot is engaged, the aircraft will automatically fly the evasive maneuver. Next up is the option to toggle the LDEF scale that you get when flying a non-precision approach. Then we have a very niche setting and one that I think only real Airbus pilots really understand. 
The Phoenix website is very brief about this and I don't really think this affects your flights in any way unless you're doing some electrical failure simulations. So I'm going to skip over this one as I'm not really qualified to talk about the Airbus electrical system. The toggle after that simply determines by what hydraulic system the aircraft steering is powered. When turned on, the yellow system powers the steering and when turned off, it is left to the green system. Having it on is the most accurate as this is what the newer Airbuses use. Next up is a setting that I find quite useful and that is the Navin go around toggle. If you use this then the aircraft automatically switches to nav mode to follow the missed approach procedure and this can really help relieve some workload during a go around which is why I personally like to have this option enabled. When turned off the aircraft will simply go into heading mode and fly runaway heading when going around. After that we have the acceleration altitude. This is the height above ground level when the aircraft pitches down to accelerate and retract the flaps. With this setting set up as it is right now, the aircraft would pitch the nose down to accelerate at an altitude of the airport elevation above sea level plus 1500 feet. Next up is the option to turn on dual advisory ice detection. Basically this enables the aircraft to give ECAM warnings whenever ice is detected. And lastly you can choose between two mounting systems for the EFB. You have the option between mounting the EFB on the frame of the window or on the window itself. The only difference other than aesthetics is that the frame mounted option allows the use of the yellow sun blind. As for the cabin we have two settings. You can toggle the cabin lights for when you are flying during the night for example. And you can choose to turn off the cabin entirely to save some frames per second. Next up is another tab with quite a few things to go over. The first setting is a bit of a new one for me. From what I could gather, SDS or side stick damping simulation is an option which enables better simulation of a real life Airbus side stick. In other words, the joystick that you use to do your flights isn't as sturdy and heavy as a real Airbus side stick. So this option tries to get as close to the real life feel as possible. Again, for a more detailed explanation, go check out A330 driver's video on it. The next setting I think is one that you have to find out for yourself as many people have different rudder pedals and varying preferences for how sensitive the pedals can be. So I would recommend playing around with it a bit. Phoenix does recommend a setting of minus 40 for the sensitivity when you turn the setting off. But again, best you find out for yourself. The scrolling acceleration option I believe increases the speed at which certain knobs turn the longer you scroll. For example, this could be useful when setting an altitude in the MCP. At first you can make fine adjustments, but the longer you scroll the faster the selected altitude will increase. The next option is purely a visual one, and this changes which side stick moves when you move your joystick or yoke. As most of you will probably know, Airbus side stick aren't mechanically linked, which means when one is moved the other one doesn't move with it, unlike the yokes in a Boeing aircraft for example. Now why is this setting here you might ask? Well, some simmers prefer to fly in the co-pilot seat and so this setting makes the co-pilot side stick move instead of the captain side stick. That's basically it, it's purely for immersion. The next option is a bit more useful to lower your workload during departures and approaches. When set to independent you have to change the barometric pressure of every altimeter separately, while you only have to set one altimeter when you set it to linked. Alternatively, you can also just use the B key on your keyboard to automatically set all the altimeters to the right setting. Next up, incremental thrust handling. This option is one that I myself only found out about while making this video, and I'm glad I did because this is quite useful for anyone who doesn't use the Thrustmaster Airbus Throttle Quadrant, which comes with a detent. What this does is when you get close to a certain detent, like climb or flex, the thrust levers snap to the correct position and when you want to go to another detent, you have to move your thrust levers a bit further to get out of the detent again. This way, it is a bit more difficult to overshoot the right detent when moving your thrust levers, which actually happens to me quite a lot during takeoff and climb. Lastly, we have two pretty self-explanatory settings. When you have these enabled, the jetway will automatically connect to your aircraft when you are parked at the gate, and the doors will open themselves. The next step is all about the radio altimeter callouts. Here you can customize which callouts you want to hear. I personally prefer to hear all of them because why not? 
After that, another pretty simple tab. Here you can change which units are used in the FMGC and the performance calculations in the EFB. The US famously still uses the Imperial unit system, so that's why these options exist. The next tab I'm not going to go over because I don't have GSX myself, so I couldn't tell you what all of these things do. Finally, we have two more settings. The first one simply enables the cabin announcements, which you can hear during flight when you are in the cabin. And the second option mutes these announcements whenever you go to another tab other than Flight Simulator. If you notice that you can't hear the announcements, it might be a good idea to turn this last setting off, as I had this very issue before, and doing this fixed it for me. And that covers pretty much all the settings in the EFB. Hopefully you found this tutorial useful in some way, and if you want to learn more, I put links to all the websites and videos I based this tutorial on in the description below. If you stuck around for this long, I really appreciate you. Be sure to do a touch and go on that like and subscribe button if you haven't already. Here's some of my other content you might be interested in. And for now, I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.